wasn't it? Just sweet to be together singing. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing that uh, God just says, hey, I am holy. You're not. <clears throat> but because of Jesus, I want to invite you into my presence. I want, I'm going to receive your worship. <clears throat> yes, I know you're flawed people. Yes, I know all the rest, but uh, I welcome you. And he welcomes us, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning as we open our, our Bibles as well. Uh, this morning, we're just going to jump right in. So will you take your Bibles and open them to Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees, uh, we're going to later learn that this Pharisee's name was P Simon, not Simon Peter, but this Pharisee's name was Simon. One of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the, to the Pharisee's house and reclined at, the t at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing beside, behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his, his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee who had invite, invited him saw this, he said to himself, Is this man, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she has loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And, it, and he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning. We, we, we pray you'd bless it to our hearts and may we just receive it as, as your gift to us. And we pray that we would be hearers this morning, but not just hearers of the word, but doers. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in case you didn't realize it, there's a lot going on in the story that I just read to you. There's a, a lot of things happening. Jesus and his disciples are sitting not at a kitchen table, but what they call a triclinium, which is a small table that had tried three sides to it. And what the people would do in that day is they'd lean, uh, lay down, and it was just raised up a little bit off the ground. On their left arm, they would break, kind of rest themselves, and they would feed themselves with their right hand. And, and that's the kind of table there he's around with this, this Pharisee as well as his disciples. Now, there's a certain etiquette that takes place. Every culture has cer certain social graces and social etiquettes if you've ever traveled, how many of you have ever taken a mission trip? Raise your hand. Okay, all over the room. You know that if you go to another culture, you have to learn different cultures, handle different things differently. And if you don't handle, do the cultural etiquette norm, you can offend people and disgrace yourself and the group that you are with. Uh, I was looking online recently, looking at some different types of social uh, uh, etiquette that takes place. For example, in... Uh, if you've ever traveled to Italy, one of the things that is true, the man is always, if he's, he and his wife or spouse are walking into an, a restaurant, the man always goes first. That is cultural etiquette according to Italian 
uh, cultural norms. Uh, in Korea, if you receive a, something to drink from an elderly, honored, respected person, an elder in the community, you do not receive the gift like that, the cup or whatever with one hand. If it's older person, you receive it with two hands and you slightly bow as you receive the gift. And when you take your first sip, you look away because that shows respect to the person that gave it to you. And so we have all these different cultural etiquette norms that are part of society. We have them here in our uh, culture as well. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering how much social etiquette you guys have this morning. So I decided to do a little test. This is audience participation time. How many of you remember a, a, a writer who wrote on social etiquette years ago, Emily Post? Okay, all of you 60 years old and over, just raise your hand. The rest of you guys are uncivilized, okay? But, but this gal wrote years ago, and there are certain norms that are, 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 are considered social etiquette, social graces that we embrace. So I'm going to... I'm going to put some questions. i got four of them up here. We're going to put them on the screen, and I want you to vote. You have to say it out loud. The first one is this. When should one start eating the main course at a formal dinner? dinner? Don't say it out loud yet. After the hostess is seated, after the hostess lifts her fork, after three or four people are served, as soon as humanly possible. <laughs> yeah, I've been to some of your houses. I know which one that is, right? Okay, so... I, on three, you're going to call out what number you think it is. One, two, three. Which is it? Okay. Let's see which one it is. You don't have as much social etiquette as you thought. After three, Emily Post says three or four people are served, then I, I always thought it was number two, right? How many of you thought two? Okay, we're all ignorant together. Let's ask the next question. Here's the next one. What do you do when, when the person across from the table from you has food in their teeth? <laughs> Number one, you stare at the food to make them feel awkward. Number two, you pick your own teeth hoping they'll get the gesture. Number three, you ask them if they are saving some for later. Number four, casually let them know. Or number five, none of the above. How many, okay, on three, you have to answer. Everybody out loud, people next to you, make sure you get the, one, two, three, what is it? It's actually number five. Obviously, Emily Post never met my staff because they would call them, dude, you got something in your teeth. You know, they just like that. Okay, let's go to number three. Is it polite to ask a guest to pray before a meal? Number one, the host should always say grace. Number two, ask the person who prays the best. <laughs> Number three, put your pastor on, spe on speakerphone and let him pray. Or don't pray because you might offend. Everybody ask the answer. One, two, three. Okay, number one is correct. I heard a predominant number one. Good job. Okay, here, here we go. Here's the last one I'll, I'll throw up there. What should you do if your cell phone goes off in church? <laughs> Look annoyingly at the person and shake your head in frustration. Make your ringtone a worship song just in case. That's awesome, right? That would be pretty awesome. Or send a past the, the pastor a gift card. Okay, just so you know, Emily Post died in 1960. So this is not applicable, but obviously the answer is there you go. You guys got it. Okay, we're on it. Okay, so we've got into this thing. Okay. There are some social graces and etiquette that should be going on. And let me tell you something. There are some things that are not happening in this particular setting. Jesus and his disciples walk in. There's Simon the Pharisee. They sit down and they start their meal. Now, there's three things not happening here. Social grace and etiquette said that you always greeted the person with a kiss. You would kiss them on each side of the cheek, and that was the way that you would greet them. If there was somebody that they were of higher esteem, you would bow before them like this. Many times they would return it and kiss you on the head. It was just this way of greeting. But Jesus gets no kiss. The second thing that you need to notice is not happening in this account that we read is that 
there's nobody washing feet. There was always a basin by the doorway because back in this day, everybody walked with open sandals. Most of them did. And you, so there was dusty trails and your feet got um, kind of dusty. And sometimes if you were laying in a certain way, your, your feet could be by somebody else. And having clean feet was kind of important. And there's a, a sign of hospitality and kindness when you would wash their feet. But nobody who washes Jesus' feet. The third thing that happened when you came to visit a guest is that you would anoint them with an ointment, a perfume of some sort. It, it kind of refreshed them. You would put it on their head, but you would, it would refresh them. And it also actually worked when people had body odor. It kind of made the room smell a little bit better. But there's no ointment. This is interesting because Simon, I mean, he should know better. He knew what were the social norms of that day, and yet he did not do any of these three. There, there's, there's no kiss. There's no water for the feet. There, there's no ointment or perfume, which makes us ask a question. Why in the world is he doing this? Does, did his mom never teach him this? I think the answer, as you'll see here, is another social norm. When you were the high Pharisee and there was a visiting rabbi that came into town, you always invited them over for a meal. That was culturally accepted. You, you were expected even. So he does that part. But he's doing it because he has to, not because he really wants to. You know what I love about Hustle Church? Is we're here because we want to be here. Not because we have to. God doesn't love us any more or any less because we show up on a Sunday morning. Maybe you're here because of some pressure from your wife or your husband, and maybe that's why you're here. But you know what? Most of the time, we're here because... We want to be here. We want to worship the Lord as we've been doing. We want to hear from the word of God in our lives. And, but Simon, in this case, he's going through the motions. He invites Jesus over because it's expected of him, but he really doesn't want to do that. So he's going through the motions. I want you to understand something. There's a big difference between religion and relationship. As your pastor, I'm not trying to make you more religious, just so you know. Re religion is man reaching up to God and trying to get his approval by, by doing, performing different duties and functions and doing the good stuff. That's religion. Relationship is God reaching down with love and sacrifice through Jesus for you and me so that we could be in a relationship with him through faith. I, I, I wrote this this last week. I'm going to put it on the screen. Go ahead. Re I, I thought I had another one, but I don't. Up here. I don't have this one on the screen. Let me just tell you what it says. You can always tell religion because it's always based on duty. You can always tell true relationship with Jesus because it's based upon desire. When we are, we go to church out of duty, got to go to church, the doors are open, duty, or is it desire? I'm here because I want to recognize, as we've been doing this morning, who God is, that he's holy, he's good and just. So let's, I want to take three, uh, attempt at three points here this morning, the difference between relationship and, and religion real quick. And the first one is this, religion focuses on goodness Jesus focuses on grace. Simon is convinced, because he's a Pharisee, that it's all about being good. You follow the law, you perform, and it's about goodness. And so that's why when he looks at this woman who comes in here, she's pitiful. She is a woman of the night. And he looks at her with disdain. This, this woman walks into the room. Everybody stares at her. Everybody knows her. <laughs> I 
She, let me tell you something. She, she did not come into this room because she wanted to hang out with Simon. It was a woman who had been most likely an adulteress, or a prostitute. She had spent her life running from all the Simons of the world. She, she came because God was in the house. We, we don't know exactly how this woman ever encountered Jesus, but Jesus had been in this area going around preaching to large crowds, and undoubtedly she had heard Jesus preach Heard, heard his teaching and his message about love, his message about forgiveness, his message about grace. And this lady heard this message and placed her faith in, in Christ. I happen to believe when she walks in here, she's a baby Christian. She, she doesn't know very much. She knows that there's a God. She knows that Jesus is talking about love and forgiveness, and that message resonates with her. And what a contrast, because there was a Simon. Simon says, no, it's about duty. It's about how you live your life. He's focused on goodness. You got to realize, by the time Simon, like most head Pharisees, by the time, listen, by the time they were 12 years old, these boys who were going to be Pharisees had memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was by the time they were 12. By the time he was 15, he had most of the Old Testament memorized. And you can't even spell Ecclesiastes. <laughs> he had looked at and read over 300 prophecies of the Messiah. And yet he is oblivious to the fact that seated at the table across the way from him is the Messiah. Because it was all about duty. And he's oblivious to it. He sees this woman come into this room, into the, to, to the room, and he, he thinks, the audacity, the audacity of this sinner Twice in this text, Luke brings out the fact that he is a, she's a sinner and not just a sinner. She's one that has a lifestyle of sin. The word that is used there in the Greek is this ongoing lifestyle of sin. Everybody knew who this woman was. They'd see her on the street and they'd go, there's that woman. People had stared at her, looked at her. And Simon's thinking if Jesus was any kind of prophet at all, he would know who she is and wouldn't want anything to do with her. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of churches that focus on goodness. I'm grateful that Hessel doesn't do that. It's not about how good we are. It's about how great Christ is when he died for us on the cross and the grace that he gives us through faith where we be, are adopted into the family of God. <laughs> this woman hadn't memorized any scripture. She, she didn't, hadn't read any of the 300 prophecies of the Old Testament. She just heard the message of grace. Luke talks about this. Maybe she was there when he, when, uh, and heard Jesus say, come, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Come, and I'm going to give you rest. And she's thinking to herself, I need me some of that rest. Look at verse 39. The Pharisee who had invited him saw this. He said to himself, he's just thinking it. He doesn't even say it out loud. He's just thinking it. Okay, got it? If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. How'd she get in in the first place? She just 
many times, back during this time, when they have meals, when you had guests over, many times they would have it in the courtyard outside, and so there would be a little wall around the courtyard, and it's not uncommon for people to come by and see who is you're having dinner with. And this time she just can't help herself. She's going to see the one who's offered her love and grace. I'm going to put this on the screen. I know I have this slide. It's only when you see your goodness as worthless that you'll see God's grace as priceless. Some of you are here this morning and you know exactly who you are. You're in the right place. It's a place of grace here at this church, but beyond that, Jesus is a God of grace. The second thing we, we learn about the contrast between religion and Jesus is that religion loves formality, and Jesus loves humble authenticity. Simon is all concerned about the outside appearance. I, churches can do this too, right? Got to look a certain way. It's all about looking good, doing the right things about following the list of do's and don'ts. Can I tell you something? Those things don't matter to Jesus. He looks at our hearts. This woman did not know any of the rules. She didn't know what the formality even was. She knew people were staring at her as she walked into the courtyard, but it wasn't the first time anybody had stared at her. You just picture this, Jesus reclining at the table, and here's this girl that walks into the room uninvited. She has this deep-seated gratitude for the love and forgiveness and grace that Jesus has been talking about. It's, it, it is deep. And all of a sudden, she walks into the room. The room goes quiet. There's a, maybe a little gasp as this woman of the night comes into the room. Silence awkward moment. And Jesus breaks the awkwardness as he smiles at this woman. His eyes lock with hers. Her eyes lock on his. Grace. A single tear starts to come down her cheek and then all of a sudden followed by a few more. Before long, the emotions have gotten the best of her. She falls to her knees, not with a single tear, but she's gushing. Why? Why? Because... Here's the answer, because she'd been overwhelmed by the love and forgiveness of Christ. Her nose is running. Her face is red. Her tears are gushing without being sacrilegious. It's a snotty mess. Because she gets it. She gets what forgiveness and love and grace is all about. She falls down and the tears start falling down and and they fall onto the feet of Jesus. And she notices something at this time. All of a sudden, her tears are making mud form on his feet. Nobody washed his feet. Nobody cared for him. And so she says, she looks around, nobody's bringing her a towel. So she does something that is unimaginable in this culture. Social etiquette would have said, this is wrong. She takes the pick out of her hair. Her hair falls down and she starts to to wipe and wash the feet of Jesus with her hair. Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you about the social norms of that day. Girls, before they were married, would wear their hair down. Once they got married, they put their hair up, they put a pick in it, and their hair stayed up here. They never took it down again, except in front of their husband. To do what this lady did in this moment was like disrobing in front of the crowd. Husbands could could divorce their spouses if their spouse ever took their hair out of the pick. 
gasp. And Jesus doesn't push her away. Jesus doesn't move away from her. She takes a flask of ointment. It was not uncommon for women to wear little flasks of, open, of ointment around their necks with a string. Uh, they would use it periodically to smell better themselves, but also in cases like this, she probably had used this flask on the feet of other men. But her life has been changed, and she's not going to need it for that anymore. And she opens up this bottle of perfume ointment, and she anoints Jesus' feet, and she kisses him. James, excuse me, Luke says that she, the, the tense of the verb, she kept on kissing his feet over and over and over. All the while, Simon's over here concerned about the outside. What does a person look like? Oh, I don't want to be one of those churches that look at people and make some judgment on the outside because you know what? Jesus is concerned about what is going on in our hearts. Not what we wear, not what zip code we find ourselves in or what, what, uh, how good an education we had or how long we've been a Christian or that we came from this side of the tracks or that side of the tracks. Jesus doesn't care about any of those things. He cares about what's going on in our hearts. But religion always is concerned about the outside, what it looks like. I'm so grateful that we have a church that strives to be concerned about the hearts, not the outside. It doesn't matter what language we speak. It does not matter what color of skin we have. It doesn't matter what our IQ is whether we are young or old, male or female, what matters is our hearts. And here's this woman kissing his feet over and over again. Why is she doing that? Because she loves the Lord. And Jesus doesn't move away because why? He loves humble authentic worship. We all need this grace and forgiveness. There's no, in the olden days, how many of you guys are old enough to remember that when we used to have church, we always had these seats up here where the pastor sat. We called them thrones. No, we didn't. <laughs> you remember those? I hate those things. To this day, I hate them because we're all the same. There's no hierarchy. We all need Jesus the same. When I, Lori and I were doing youth group ministry years and years ago, the earth was still cooling, I think. <laughs> we had this very vivacious, large youth group, and it was great. I've used this story before, but I want to remind you maybe of it. We had this, this great group, and they, God was doing things in our, in our midst. It's just so fun to be a part of it. To this day, we get together. We have these little reunions on occasion. It's like we pick up, you know, where we left off. I mean, you've got to realize that, that some of my youth group kids are 58 years old, but that's another story, right? We had this one kid. He lived over here on Stony Point Road, and he found out about our youth group, and he came. His name was Artie. Artie had one eye that went this direction, one that could focus. And Artie, Artie had some challenges in life. He, being raised by a single mom, and uh, he lived, they had no driveway. It was out in the middle of a field. Lori and I go by there periodically and go, that's where Artie used to live, in the middle of a field. They had this, this uh, big trailer, a trailer they'd brought in there and that was their home, and Artie was out in the middle of this farm, and you didn't have to know he lived there. You could smell that he lived there because Artie's hygiene was not real good. And, um, 
So Artie starts coming, and he was a quirky guy. And our group just kind of reached out, opened up their arms like this, and they started loving on Artie. And, and so all of a sudden, I get a phone call from Artie's mom, and Artie's mom says, hey, my car's down. We can't, I, I can't afford either to, even when it is working, to get Artie to church. Um, can you figure out a way to get him there? And I said, sure. So we had these two gr- sisters in our youth group, good-looking gals, popular girls. They were coming from Petaluma, and would, I asked them, would you guys mind just picking up Artie on the way through so he can come? And they said, sure. Now, when Artie got in the car, the smell of that car changed. And so these girls said to me, Rich, do you know how bad our car smells when we pick up Artie and get him to church? And I said, yeah, yeah, I can kind of, sometimes when he got off the bus, the bus smelled a little differently too, and that was the whole bus. And, and uh, so they said, no, we'll, we'll take him. And, and I said, well, after a while I checked in, I said, well, how are you girls doing? Oh, we're doing fine. I said, well, how's it working with the smell thing? We just put our windows down, and we just, you know, it could be 30 degrees outside. Our windows are down so we can breathe on the way to church. And Artie, though he had challenges, placed his faith and trust in Jesus, and his life was forever changed. It doesn't matter if you're popular or you're smelly. We all need grace. We, we all need the, the same thing that this woman needed. We need grace and forgiveness. The church should never be a gated community where certain people can't come in because we're, we're, we're for the, the good-looking people. We're for, the, we're for the, 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 the people without flaws. Simon, boy, he's a piece of work. I mean, he's sitting there going, boy, if you, Jesus were really a prophet, he'd know who she is, what she's done. He wouldn't let her touch him. Can I tell you who really didn't understand? Simon the Pharisee. Simon the Pharisee thought that Jesus would only like nice people. Pharisees always get ticked off when they find out that Jesus loves bad people. Simon would have been happy if he would, if Jesus would have just pushed this woman away. Not, not only does Jesus know, let Simon know that he's a prophet and he, he knows everything that this woman has done, but he also knows what kind of man Simon is. The church is not for perfect people. We're all flawed and broken, and we're all in need of grace. Here's our third point. Boy, I think, I think that uh, Ryan took too much of my time. That's the problem here. Sorry, buddy. Religion spotlights the past. Jesus spotlights the possibility. It, it is not where your heels have been. It is where your toes are pointed that matters. And Simon is so mad Jesus looks at him and says, okay, Simon, let me ask you a question, okay? What's the question? Okay, let's suppose there's two men. One owes 500 denarii, which is the equivalent of about 500 days' wages. The other one owes 50 denarii, about 50 days of of wages. And there's, they can't pay. So the one they owe the money to says, I'm going to forgive you both. Jesus says, Simon, I got a question for you. Which one do you think would love the canceller of debt the most? And Simon says, well, I suppose the one that's the 500 denarii. And Jesus says, suppose? Are you crazy? The answer is simple. Of course the $500 one, 500 denarii one. Why? Because it's more. Simon, she gets it. She's a 500 sinner. And you're a 50 sinner. And you're both sinners. She loves me more because she understands how much I've forgiven her. And 
That's why her, ex- her worship is exuberant and over the top, right? She gets it. Implying, Simon, you don't get it. Those who are forgiven the most love the most. And then she says, hey, she hasn't stopped kissing me since I got here. He says to her, your sins are forgiven. Let's stop for a moment. Were her sins forgiven because she came in with the ointment and the kisses and the tears? Is that what made her forgiven? No. How was she saved? The same way anybody is saved through, for by grace you've been saved through what? Faith. Her faith. Your faith has saved you. And then he says, go in peace. I can't help but think, how many nights did that woman go to bed with the absence of peace? The word there is shalom. Go in shalom. Go in peace. Church, do you realize that the greatest sinners in the history of the church so many of them have become the greatest saints or believers of the church. Did you realize that the apostle Paul was a murderer, in prisoner? Many of you guys know the story of uh, maybe of Augustine, who was this guy who grew, grew up in a Christian home. He turned his back. He became a lustful a uh, sexual addict, if you were to use today's vernacular, and she, he's just living crazy, and then he starts to write in the, in the first couple of centuries after Christ, and he becomes one of the greatest, first greatest theologian of the time. John Newton, many of you know the story of John Newton, the slave trailer, a bully, a guy that, that hated so much and God got a hold of his life, and he later writes this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Can I tell you something? Listen, if you're here today, and you've got a past, <laughs> let me tell you something. That past, you're not bound by that. God's love, forgiveness, and grace gives you the opportunity to be used by him in ph- phenomenal ways. Can you imagine what it's going to be like one day, the glory one day, when in some corner of heaven we bump into people the likes of which of this lady and you say, yeah, my pastor did an okay job with Luke chapter 7, but tell me the rest of the story. Tell me how it really went down. Share the grace and the love because one day in heaven, we're going to all be gathering together and sharing our testimonies. We all need grace. We need to be a church of grace. Listen, it's because of what Christ did for us on the cross that we can be forgiven. James Merritt says this. Merritt, excuse me. You don't give up your sin, and then you qualify for the grace of God. You receive the grace of God, and he gives you the power to give up your sin. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus, let me tell you something. This woman had all kinds of sin. You've got all kinds of sin, too. Forgiveness and grace is offered to all. Because honestly, guys, I'm a 500 sinner. And when you get your 500 sinner, your worship changes. You don't go through formal worship. Your heart overflows with gratitude. Your tears sometimes, it can become a snotty mess sometimes because you get you were a 500 sinner like I am. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much that the gospel is for all people doesn't matter if we've been married once or divorced twice, if we're liberal or we're conservative, we're religious or irreligious. It doesn't matter if we're an alcoholic or a teetotaler. All of us need grace. 
The gospel of forgiveness is not just for the well-educated and well-mannered. It's not for healthy families. Just for healthy families. It's for all families. Lord, this morning we come here today with just deep gratitude. Lord, may we understand that the grace of God is amazing. It blows our minds. May we understand that we are the recipients of forgiveness and love that we don't deserve. And may that free us up to just worship you, to live for you. I'm going to give you a moment just to respond to what we've been looking at this morning. If you've been forgiven and received a recipient of grace, just thank him. If you've never trusted him as Lord and Savior, just within the quietness of your heart, just pray with me. Lord, I'm I'm a sinner. 500 sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. For the resurrection, I believe in you. And I give my life to you now. Jesus, we love you that you don't kick us away and force us away. Lord, may you remind every person here that though we were 500 sinners, God, you still have a plan for our lives that can be used because all of us need your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.